Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Morgan with the College of St. Scholastica and director of the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice, and it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the fourth in a series of lectures we're doing this year on confronting global poverty. As I said, this is the fourth in a series of lectures in this series, but it's not the last program uh, at the college on the subject of poverty. In fact, a week from tonight, um, another organization, I'm reading this to make sure I get it right, because uh, the St. Scholastica uh, Oric Alprin Interreligious Forum is uh, going to have a program here at 7 p.m. a week from tonight entitled Pedagogy of the Poor, uh, featuring two speakers, uh, Willie Baptist and John Wessel McCoy, kind of hands-on issues on poverty in the United States. So um, this is not the last word on poverty. And, and by the way, that those two uh, gentlemen will be doing a couple of community workshop sessions on the subject of poverty, <coughs> excuse me, in the United States. And information about all that is uh, out in the lobby on flyers like this. Uh, but tonight's program, we're back to the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice, is brought to you by the above mentioned uh, organization and is funded also in part by the Warner Lecture Series of the Manitou Fund and by Reader Weekly. These lectures also have received special support from the DeWitt and Carolyn Van Evra Foundation and from Mary C. Van Evra in memory of William P. Van Evra, a former trustee of the college. Additional support, this is new, has been received from the Royal D. Allworth Junior Institute at UMD. This was a, definitely a cooperative venture and our speaker spent much of the day at UMD and the evening performance is here at St. Scholastica. So I'm particularly appreciative of folks at UMD, Cindy Christian, Catherine Millen, and even Julie O'Leary, who is not at UMD, but she's the one who put this idea in my head about inviting this speaker. So I'm grateful to all those people as well, as, as well as to the usual band of suspects here at St. Scholastica. As we always do uh, for all these lectures, we have a talkback session slated uh, next week, and uh, hopefully you have flyers uh, that talk about that. I always think it's interesting after, after lectures that people from outside the area who give us interesting information, we have a chance to process it and talk about it with people who are perhaps more connected than I am or, or you are. And uh, as it says on this flyer, this will be facilitated by Essie Leoso Corbin, and she is a Bad River tribal member from northern Wisconsin. If you've been following the news at all, you know that those people are kind of interested in water these days, more so than ever. Uh, and that will be at Concordia Lutheran Church this coming Monday, 7 p.m. You all know where that is on Woodland Avenue, I, I trust. Um, I think I have all the, the preliminary work behind me now, so I can introduce our speaker, who has for decades been a leading voice, arguing that access to safe drinking water should be a basic human right. She's been called by some the Al Gore of water. Ms. Barlow is the national chairperson of the Council of Canadians, Canada's largest public advocacy organization. In addition, she is the co-founder of the Blue Planet, Planet Project, an organization with partners around the world that works for water justice. She also chairs the board of Washington-based Food and Water Watch. She's a founding member of the San Francisco-based International Forum on Globalization and is a counselor with the Hamburg-based World Future Council. Ms. Barlow is the recipient of 11 honorary doctorates as well as many awards, including the 2005 Right Livelihood Award and a Citation of Lifetime Achievement, which she received at the 2008 Canadian Environmental Awards, the 2009 Earth Day Canada Outstanding Environmental Achievement Award, 
the 2009 Planet in Focus Echo Hero Award and the 2011 Earth Care Award. That's the highest international honor of the Sierra Club. In 2008, 2009, she was senior advisor on water to the president of the United Nations General Assembly and she was a leader in the campaign to have water recognized as a human right by the United Nations. She's author or co-author of dozens of reports as well as 16 books, including Blue Covenant, The Global Water Crisis and the Coming Battle for the Right to Water, and that book is on sale in the lobby after the lecture. Her, another book is coming out, the next book, that'd be book number 17, is coming out in September. She tells me it provides more answers than the first and the other one, Blue Future, Protecting Water for People and Planet Forever in September. She makes her home in Ottawa with her husband, Andrew, who is an attorney. And when she's not thinking about water and working on water issues, she enjoys jogging and spending time with her grandchildren, Maddie 10, Ellie 10, Angus 8, and Max 7. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Maud Barlow. <laughs> Wow, thank you very much, Tom, for an absolutely lovely introduction and a very warm and human uh, introduction. Um, and thank you all for being here tonight. It's one of the first uh, spring evenings, and so the fact that you're here is um, doubly um, lovely for me. Thank you. Um, not that I compare myself in any way, but um, I once read that after a very moving introduction, Winston Churchill said he could hardly wait to hear what he had to say. <laughs> I always think good introductions should come after in case people say, oh, she wasn't that special. I don't know. Uh, thank you to the College of St. Scholastica. St. Scholastica. It's just wonderful to be here. To the Allworth family and the other sponsors. Uh, to Catherine Malone from UND, who has been my host all during the day. We had a wonderful workshop uh, today on the whole co concept of public trust for the Great Lakes. If anybody's interested, do contact Catherine, who's doing a work on this. And I want to say a special welcome. I don't know where you are in the room, Josephine, but we have a very famous and wonderful person in the room with us. Her name is Josephine Mandeman. Where are you, Josephine? <laughs> Josephine. <clears throat> from, uh, is a fellow Canadian. Josephine was the first water walker. Josephine started the whole process of the women water walkers when she, she first of all, I think she started with Lake Superior, walked pretty well by herself around Lake Superior. I'm not just making that up. Uh, one summer after another did every single other lake and felt that she was finally finished and I can't remember who said to you, somebody said to you, you you've got to do the St. Lawrence River. <laughs> so Josephine uh, uh, was sent down to, to uh, finish the job and, and she's a great heroine and a great friend of, of all of us, a great friend of the Great Lakes and I, I'm just honored um, that she joined us um, with her family here tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the crisis globally, and I want to come back here to the U.S., but, and I do want to talk about the twin crises of um, poverty and uh, water injustice, but also I want to talk about uh, the, the issues of climate and the, the water crisis, the actual environmental crisis. And I want to start off by saying we have a tendency to separate those issues particularly in the water world, I find there's the scientists, the environmentalists working on the environmental <clears throat> crisis, chronicling the loss of water and the pollution and so on, and then we have people doing the human rights, poverty work, development work over here, and they're just like in separate planets, and I think it's wrong. I think we have to build an analysis that puts those together, and I think we have to build a solution that puts them together too, because if you are poor, and you have nowhere to go to use the bathroom, you're going to go in the local river or the local forest or wherever you can. And so it's impossible to keep water clean if people don't have uh, sanitation facilities. At the same, so it's impossible to ask them to make that a priority. 
Um, at the same time, if we don't have a healthy environment, there's no way that we're going to be able to provide anything for the entire world with a population that may add another 3 billion people to the planet by 2050. Uh, 2050. So we need to think very, very clearly about how to protect the world's water sources and how to share them more equitably. And this is extraordinarily important that we have that kind of image. And I know I'm in a room full of people who love water, you love your big lake, and you're here because you love water and you want to be a steward of that water. So, but I do want to start off with some stats that I think we have to just place in our, in our heads and hearts. Every year, more people die of waterborne disease and unsafe water than all forms of violence, including war. Some 3.6 million people, 1.5 million of them, children, die every year from a, a lack of access to clean water, mostly from related diseases, many of which we thought we had eradicated decades ago. One billion people still uh, practice open defecation, and 2.5 billion live without basic sanitation services. Now, let me just say that again. One, point, uh, one billion people still practice open defecation, but 2.5 billion live without basic sanitation services. So if they don't have them in their home, <clears throat> and where they're going is they're paying somebody money to use an outhouse. There's one common toilet in Mumbai, India, that services 5,000 people. Try to imagine. By 2030, more than 5 billion people, or 70% of the world population, may be without adequate sanitation. And this is as people are emptying out of the rural communities around the world and moving into these peri-urban slums around the big cities where they are not recognized as, as, as settlements and therefore the governments are not feeling obliged to provide them with health care and water and, and, and so on. This is a huge ish women's issue because in the global south it is largely a woman's job to go walking for water, go finding water for her family. And many in many countries women will walk uh, four, five, six hours a day to find water and come back and of course <clears throat> they bring their girl children with them. So consequently many girls around the world don't go to school uh, because they're accompanying their mother on this, on this trip. As well many schools don't have any sanitation facilities and the girls don't want to go to a school that doesn't have a private place for them to use the washroom. So we're finding that this is really having an impact on the whole question of equality. In terms of sheer numbers, so what I want to say to you here strongly, and this is a new study from the World Health Organization said that in the global south, every three and a half seconds, a child dies of waterborne disease. In terms of sheer numbers, the, the lack of access to clean water and sanitation is the greatest threat to human rights in our world today. One could, if one just looks at the, the strict numbers, um, there isn't anything that actually comes closely, uh, close to it. Now this is clearly an issue of poverty and injustice. Global income disparities are at a place they haven't been in a hundred years. We have enormous growth uh, in income disparity between uh, uh, between classes within countries and, of course, between the global north and the global south. The $240 billion net income uh, last year of the hundred richest men in the world would make extreme poverty history four times over if we had access to the, that money of the 10, the, sorry, the 100 richest people in the world, we would wipe out all forms of poverty. Certainly it would take care of the global water crisis many times over. The richest 1% have increased their income by 60% in the last 20 years. And here's a stat that is absolutely uh, astounding. The financial crisis accelerated their wealth. So when you ask what happened during that financial crisis and you look at the suffering, for instance, in Europe and you see people having their water turned off and their hydro turned off and being turfed out of their homes and people losing their pensions and unemployment at historic highs, it's important to remember that the wealthy made money from that crisis. A child born, now this is very much of course a north-south issue, a child born in the north will consume 30 to 50 times more water in their lifetime than a child born in the global south. <clears throat> but even within regions, it's really important to know that we now have huge disparities. And in most countries in the world, there is great wealth alongside great poverty. I remember going to the World Summit on Sustainable um, Development, which was the second Rio. That was the one back in 2002 in Johannesburg, South Africa. 
and oh, they held the, the summit, the official summit in uh, a community called Sandon, which is the financial district, the financial heart of all of Africa, not just South Africa, and with you know huge five-star hotels and gorgeous golf courses. To get into the meeting, you had to go buy uh, advertising for De Beers, diamonds, and and Cadillacs, and it was just it was just money. And between Sandon and a township called Alexandra, there's a river that has a little river that has cholera warning signs on it. And if you just cross over a little bridge, you go from this incredible first world luxury to absolute complete abject poverty with no running water, kids with no uh, you know shoes on their feet, rats in the gutter, and so on. And we were there one day, uh, the government had, with using a private company uh, called Suez, had put in water meters. They brought in a pipe, uh, a state-of-the-art pipe, a state-of-the-art tap, uh, right up to each block, not to each house, but to each block of hovels. And we're talking really tar paper shacks, but they were state-of-the-art, carrying lovely clean water, but between the pipe and the, and the tap, was a state-of-the-art uh, water meter. And the only way you could get the water was to go get your electronic key charged up. You had to pay money for it, and then you touched it, and then every drop that you took, you were charged for. I remember standing with <coughs> one activist who said, it gives new meaning to that saying, water, water, everywhere, but ne'er a drop uh, to drink. Because you know, when you've got 80% unemployment, people don't have they just simply don't have money. So it's very important for us to know that even in the global south, there are these disparities. But it's not just in the global south, and I want to make this case very strongly to you tonight, that here in North America and in Europe, where we are seeing a double whammy of increasing water prices, often because of privatization, and increasing economic disparities and more people in poverty, we're seeing water cutoffs here. In Detroit, Michigan, the government, uh, the municipal government cut the water services to 42,000 people about five years ago, mostly African Americans, elderly people, some single mothers. Uh, I've been working with that community. There's a wonderful community that's come together to put together that, the justice issues around the right to water and, and uh, the po you know, people's poverty uh, issues and the environment and saying, well, whose Great Lakes are these? And you know, why can't we have water from the Great Lakes when we're, we're right here? Um, and, but they say that it's probably closer to 90,000 now. They've just kept cutting the, the, the water. And we're talking about people who are actually going out with buckets and, and you know, laden down with, with, just as you see in third world you know, pictures in the third world, going out into parks, into libraries, in anywhere they can to fill up the buckets and take them home. And there have been cases where Social Security has come in and taken, or social services, I mean, and has taken their kids away because there's no water. In, the, uh, in Europe, where they have this um, crisis, the austerity crisis, they are selling off the water services and they've raised the price of, of water really dramatically. And there are a lot of cutoffs in countries like Greece and Italy, um, all the, the southern countries, the ones that have, have, uh, have had such trouble making their uh, debt uh, relief uh, renegotiations. So this is not just an issue in the global south. And as water gets more scarce around the world and as water prices go up and and there are more poor people, we are going to see this issue in the, in the so-called global north or the first world as well. For my mind, the global, the water issue is deeply connected to an inequitable wrong, <laughs> in many ways, uh, global economic system, which is based on some values that I think are absolutely false. It really is about competition and the, and the race for money. We're seeing uh, the, the belief in growth at all costs, this, this notion of unlimited growth. We can keep growing more stuff, more trade, uh, protected by trade agreements that basically protect corporate rights. They do not protect the rights of people. Um, <clears throat> protected by clauses in investment and, corp and, and trade agreements that actually cor give corporations the right to sue governments of another country if that country tries to bring in any environmental or labor controls or whatever, or tries to hold on to local economic development and tries to make local jobs for people, they can say, no, 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 that's a barrier to trade and we can, we can sue you. And we actually have cases now where foreign corporations are saying they own the water, the actual water, 
in a country that they're operating in. An American company called Abitibi Bowater was, op was operating in a, a province of Canada called Newfoundland. That's the rock, the one off the, the east coast of uh, Canada. And if you ever go there, you'll fall in love and not ever want to come back. It's the most wonderful place. This is a place where if you look like you're going to step out into the street, they'll stop and they'll come right to a halt, right in the middle of the street, and they'll say, off you go now, ducks. They call everybody ducks. And you just go right across the road. I mean, they're the nicest people in the world. Well, Abitibi Bowater operated there for years and years, created jobs, all that was good. They went bankrupt four years ago, and they left. And they sued under NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreements, Chapter 11, which isn't the bankruptcy chapter, it's the right to, to sue. They, they said to the government of Newfoundland, well, you owe us money for the water we left behind. And the government of Newfoundland said, you had access to that water when you were creating jobs here, but you not only left jobs, you didn't even pay the pensions. Excuse us. So they used NAFTA to go after it, and the Canadian government settled with them for $130 million. So this is a precedent that is being set, and as we have more of these agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and a new one between Canada and Europe and now the European uh, US agreements in the, its infancy but is moving ahead. These corporate rights are, are, are basically there. So basically, this form of, of economic development uh, is, is at war with the, the human right to water. And I'm telling you when I say right now in our world there are governments making the choice between giving water to an economic development, say a free trade zone or a big dam or whatever or modernization and letting people die. And this is happening, I just did a, in my new book, I just wrote a, a whole case study on Karnataka, which is a state in India where they have decided that their water resources, which are terrible. I mean, they've had no water left. They've had a terrible drought. Many, many, many villages are going under. This is a place, again, with very high rates of people having no sanitation, no access to clean water. What are they building? They're building these expensive free trade zones, and they're using their water to entice industry from around the world. So they're literally making the choice to give the water to economic development rather than um, to people. So this issue of human right, the human right to water, or the, the right not to watch your kid die of a of, of waterborne disease is absolutely real and it's happening um, right now. Um, but I have to say, so that, so that's, there's injustice. We have a system of deep injustice and I would argue that we have a system where our governments accept that this injustice exists. I'm not saying they like it, I'm not saying that's their choice, but I believe that they say that's a corollary of the system that we have and eventually uh, and this process will rise all boats, the big ships and the big yachts and the little boats too. It's not true, but that's their image and, and uh, they call the trickle-down theory. So, but, so that's one half of the equation, but the other half of the equation is that we are also running out of clean water. Now you say to me, Maude, how can that be? Back in grade six, I learned that there's a certain amount of clean, accessible water on the planet. It goes round and round in the hydrologic cycle. It can never go anywhere, so we can't destroy it. So what are you talking about? This is what I'm talking about. It is true that the water is all on the planet somewhere, but we have done everything conceivable in our power to destroy accessible access to clean water. <clears throat> what I mean by that is, A, we're polluting it, and that includes we're polluting a lot of groundwater. It doesn't take a lot of a certain kind of chemical to destroy a whole aquifer. We are taking, uh, we are damming our rivers, damming and diverting our rivers to death so we can grow crops in deserts that we should not be growing crops in, so we can have this global trade in food, so that we can ship water out of our region in the form of, uh, of exports. And what you need to know is this is called virtual water. Virtual water is the water that is in the food that you produce or the computers or the desks or whatever, but mostly in food. And if you then export that food away, whether it's a, you know an animal or a grain or cotton or biofuels, which is a huge water guzzler, if you if you export it, it's as if you put um, a pipe in that in that water system and sucked it out. You may as well do that because agriculture consumes water. That means it uses it and does not put it back into the basin. So the more it's traded globally, the more you're losing water. And most Americans are stunned to know that you use fully a third of your daily water intake, your water withdrawals in this country, 
to go into products that are exported right out of the country. And most of that's commodities that come from the states that don't have the rain to do it, and most of those are coming from the Ogallala Aquifer, which cannot sustain this in any way. So that's another way in which water is being used. We know that the way we use, what we use energy is uh, doubling the abuse and destruction of water. Um, and then we're pumping groundwater far, far faster than nature can replenish it. A recent UN conducted study around the world said we're doubling the takings of, of groundwater every 20 years. And what this means is that we're taking that ancient aquifer water up faster than the rain can replenish it, way faster, which means that in a lot of places, they're literally coming to the bottom of the water table. Just imagine a bunch of people sitting around a full bathtub with blindfolds and straws, and everybody's drinking the water, nobody can see where it is. There's lots of water for everybody until there isn't a drop of water, and it happens. This is what uh, scientists mean by exponential ab abuse. Uh, globally, our water withdrawals are, have risen 50% in the last two decades, and we now have a new global, another global study that tells us that by 2030, it's not very far away, global demand will outstrip supply by 40%. Okay, try to imagine what we mean when we say that. What does that mean? Where is the water going to come from for that 40% of the world's population? Is it just going to be people who can afford to buy it? No, I'm staying in this lovely hotel, Fisker's Hotel, Fitzer's Hotel. It's absolutely exquisite and every piece of it is perfect except they have this Fiji water in my room, big thing of Fiji water. $3.50 for this water that's been sitting in plastic at room temperature, you should never be drinking anything that sat in plastic at room temperature or warmed up because the plastic, chemi the chemicals leach and we know this from studies. So I wouldn't touch that stuff if it were the last water on earth. But the Fijians are furious and fighting very hard to try to get rid of this bottled water company because it's taking all their water. And again, the local people are being denied water. So we can have $3.50 Fijian water in, in, our, in our rooms. This is the kind of thinking about water that it's just this kind of resource for us, for our, for our pleasure and profit and, and, and uh, convenience. And we've stopped having don't think this is foolish, but I think this is the right place to say this, the right college. We've stopped having reverence for water. We've stopped having, we've stopped, we have, we've lost our humility around nature, and we just think of it as being there <clears throat> for us. So what we know is because we're transferring, and by the way, a lot of that water gets transferred from rivers, lakes, and aquifers into great big cities, and if those great big cities, and remember, some of them are 15, 20, 30 million people, if those big, they're, so they're thirsty, they're sucking up that water when they're finished it, if they're anywhere near the ocean, they're dumping it in the ocean, they're not returning it to land. So one of this, another recent study said that one of the major causes of the oceans rising is not climate change as we've understood it. It's not just greenhouse gas emission warming, it's actual transfer of land-based water in, into the ocean. Uh, 100, oh, in a, over 100 countries, uh, the deserts are expanding rapidly. 24,000 villages in northern China have had to be closed uh, because of desert encroachment. Just literally, they've been dried up. So we have scientists talking about what they call hot stains. These are places like all of northern China where they've used their water to produce their so-called economic miracle so that all of the you know, running shoes and toys and stuff, not all, but lots of them for the world are made there. So they've chosen to use their water for that rather than leave it in watersheds or grow food with it. India, in Mumbai, they've hit the bottom of the water table in many parts of that city. Many parts of India are in deep trouble, as is Pakistan. The Middle East, every single country in the Middle East is due to run out within 30 to 50 years. And I mean run out. I don't mean drought, I mean run out. And a new study from NASA using satellite imagery said that the groundwater withdrawals and the groundwater shrinking is happening about twice as fast as was previously predicted there. Mexico City sinking on itself. I don't know if you've ever noticed if you've gone there or seen pictures that the churches are all kind of a little on the side. That's because they took up all the water under the ground. It's called subsidence and, the, and everything heavy is settling down and it's slowly sinking. Australia, they've grown crops, massive crops, cotton, rice, 
wine, of course, the producing wine, all along their major water source, the Murray Darling, and they've sucked that water up and then they ship it around the world in this, uh, in this uh, virtual water. Um, and the Murray Darling, every couple of years, just stops reaching the ocean. So Adelaide, which is the city right at the bottom, is having to build very expensive, very energy consuming um, uh, desalinization plants because they're, they're um, terrified and desperate. Africa, 22 countries in Africa are in trouble. Uh, all around the Mediterranean, um, they're in trouble. And the US. The US, you can't say the US as a whole is in trouble. There are parts of the US that are in trouble. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, uh, US government says that there are 36 states in either current or soon to be in serious or severe water crisis. The Colorado River is only producing about half the food the, the, and, the, and the water flow that it was um, 30 years ago. And the Ogallala Aquifer is the aquifer that goes down the spine of the, of the American Midwest, right across the Great Plains. This was the story of, of the miracle of feeding all of the United States, and they, they export huge amounts of that Ogallala Aquifer water around the world, $20 billion worth every year. Uh, it's drying up. They have 200,000 bore wells. Now try to picture a bore well. These were, these were discovered by an American in the Midwest in 1953, these centrifugal bore wells. And they changed agriculture because you're no longer just talking about a, pulling water out of a well, you're talking about sending a bore well down as deep into the ground as Chicago skyscrapers go in the air, and then it just starts pumping water 24-7. Uh, and they have pumped the Ogallala Aquifer water so hard that Dr. David Brower, who is the head of the Ogallala Service Center for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, says it'll be gone in our lifetime. The plains will stop producing food in our lifetime. Now, when I read that, about two years ago, he's made that statement. I thought, now that's going to be headline in every single paper in, the, in North America, right? I mean, what a statement. Nothing. It didn't even get reported, basically, in the science journals. We have what I call a myth of abundance. We can't imagine that there's a problem, therefore there isn't a problem. Uh, or we think, well, maybe there's a problem, but somebody's going to fix it. Somebody's going to have a technology that's going to fix it. And I, I'm here to tell you I don't think so. So when we look at the Great Lakes then, what do we see? Well, we still see a, these beautiful lakes, but I have to tell you, we see these beautiful lakes in great decline. We see beautiful lakes that have invasive species, multi-point pollution. We have uh, lakes that are in such decline in terms of the, the depth that the American government, that your government, put out a statement uh, a couple of months ago saying that the, the Great Lakes are now at the lowest level they've ever been recorded since they started taking records in 1918. Um, now, this is not just climate change, although climate change is a big part of it, because 70% of the ice cover is gone from the Great Lakes over the last three decades. So that means the water is evaporating faster than it should be. But we're also talking about um, over-extraction, just taking all of us around the lakes, taking more out of the lakes than we're putting uh, back in. And I have to tell you about a new concern that I have, and that is that the tar sands bitumen from the tar sands of northern Alberta, which is a very huge operation to take this bitumen. This is stuff, this is oil that's stuck in muck, basically, in sand and water. So to get it out of the sand and water, they have to steam blast it using massive amounts of water. And in Alberta, what they've done with that water is they leave it in huge lagoons that are just absolutely one of them. The Syncrude site is the second largest dam in the world. The only larger one is um, uh, the Three Gorges Dam in, in, uh, in China. <clears throat> and it holds poison water. That water is so poison that they have gunshots all along around the, the lagoon all, every couple of seconds to keep the birds from, from landing as if they land, they die. This is the dirtiest oil on earth. And it is coming right through your community in a pipeline called the Alberta Clipper. You know about the Keystone issue, but you might not know that the Alberta Keys, uh, Clipper is bringing the same crude into your community. It's going to Superior where it's, some of it's refined, some of it's passed on to other refineries, and now the latest project that they're proposing is that they open up the dock in Superior 
get that crude, and we're talking still, it's, it's filled with chemicals. It's called, uh, um, it's diluted bitumen, so it's called dilbit. It's diluted with chemicals so it can move through the pipeline because it's still this really heavy stuff, hasn't been refined. They want to take this dilbit and they want to put it in barges and ships and ship it around the Great Lakes. They want to ship some of it back to Canada. Riddle me that, like how does this happen, right? They want to ship some of it down the, down the St. Lawrence to the eastern seaboard. So we are, you know, we are watching now, in my opinion, a whole new wave of threats against the lakes, including um, fracking and including mining on this side of, of, of the, fracking on our side of the border more, I think, um, but, and the New York side, of course, and then, um, uh, you know, the, the, the mining, the new mines that, that are being proposed. Now, how does this come to this? Because we do have governments that have, have all these air quality agreements and water quality and fish quality agreements and all of that, and we've got all these great environmental groups. I would argue there are two reasons. One is that we have so many jurisdictions, eight states, two provinces, two countries, all these municipalities, and they haven't coordinated their coming together around what needs to happen. And I, my argument, my answer is we've got to start thinking in terms of watershed-wide governance. That's the answer here. We've got, to, we've got to see the Great Lakes as a lake, a watershed, and we have to change our, our, our kind of governance. But I think the major issue is that too many people do not see it as a living element that gives us all life, that is the basis of an ecosystem that gives us life and livelihood. I think too many people look at the Great Lakes and just see it as a big dollar sign. And when we see nature as a big dollar sign, and when we only see it as a resource to serve us, that's part of that system that creates the kind of injustice and poverty that I started this evening off with. Because I deeply believe that if you have reverence for the earth and other species, you have reverence for other people, and vice versa. If we can start to see the equality of other people um, who may live in very different circumstances. And if we can start to open our heads and our hearts, come up with better economic and social and development models, this is going to be good for the environment in a, in a very important way. Um, we have conflicts growing around the world on water. We have the conflict around who owns water. Should it be a, a commodity put on the open market for sale like running shoes or Coca-Cola? The head of Nestle, a guy uh, named Peter Brabick, says, yep, that's what we should do. He says, well, he fought us on the right to water until we won. And then he said, OK, let's put 1.5% of the world's water aside for the poor, and everything else goes on the open market like oil and gas. And then it'll just go to whoever can afford it. Uh, maybe those without money will die. He doesn't say that, but it's got to be the next statement, doesn't it? I mean, isn't that the corollary to just let it go where the market takes it? Uh, and so we've been fighting privatization of water services where the World Bank has basically gone into countries and the Global South particularly and said, if you want funding for water, you have to bring in a private company. I was involved uh, with the Bolivian uprising when Bechtel, which knew nothing about water, a big engineering company, was given the contract to uh, deliver water in Cochabamba, Bolivia. And uh, the first thing they did was raise the price of water three times. And this is a largely indigenous, very poor country. People could not afford it. And then they said, not only do we own the water services, we own the water coming out of the sky. And if you're collecting water, you owe us money. And they had inspectors going around telling people that they had to pay for the water that they collected in cisterns on their roofs. So there was a revolution led by a four foot seven shoe mechanic, <laughs> a hero uh, named Oscar Oliveira, who'd never been outside his community before. And we've brought him all over the world to speak on this now. But at the time, he just, he didn't know, he, wasn't, he didn't think he was brave. He just saw something deeply wrong and led this revolution. People were killed. They brought in the army. But eventually, the people prevailed, and the company left and uh, sued under one of these trade agreements, these investment agreements. But we embarrassed them so much that when they won, because technically they had been kicked out, uh, they settled for a dollar. So it was a, it was a nice, it was a nice win on our side. And the government, the new government of Evo Morales, just basically said, "No more privatization. We're going to take care of our own, our own water and people." Then we have bottled water. I mean, if you were to take the individual bottles that we all, or not we, but some people <laughs> consumed last year, put just the little ones and on just water, 
and put them end to end, they would reach to the moon and back 65 times. Just try to think of the garbage we're putting into our environment, into the oceans, everywhere. When you can turn on the tap, not everywhere, I grant you, but surely here in Duluth, you can turn on the tap and get the sweetest water in the world. Then we have water trading, where water gets, uh, a company gets to own the actual water and then gets trading. And we have in this country, T. Boone Pickens, the energy gazillionaire, who's now hoarding water from the Ogallala Aquifer and selling it to developers. Um, and I believe that's wrong. I think we have to say nobody can own water. All water belongs to all of us, it belongs to the future, it belongs to other species. You can use it, you can pass it on, but you cannot own it and sell it and hoard it while other people are dying for the need for it. So solutions. Um, there are many, many people doing many wonderful things around the world, but I guess the most important concept I want to leave with you tonight is in a world of declining water stocks, increasing demand, and increasing inequality, not just poverty, but in increasing wealth, but divided, we need to do two things really importantly. We need to take care of water in a totally different way. And number two, we have to share it more justly and equitably. That is what we have to do. And we have to do it while we go through this peak population. There's going to be a number of decades where we have a larger population and then people tell us that that's going to fall off a bit. So while that's happening, we need to be uh, very conscious of, of, of sharing in a, in, a, in a particular way. So I would just point, put to you three fundamental principles that I think we need to adopt um, when we look at water policy generally and then, then maybe even the Great Lakes because we're also here to, to talk about our local water. The first is that water is a common heritage and a public trust. And that means that we say the water of this particular watershed, in this case it's, it's the Great Lakes, belongs to the people who live on it and love it. It doesn't belong in the sense that we own it, but it, we are the stewards of this water while we are here. And we are the caretakers, and we have what I call the right to care. We also have the responsibility to care and the responsibility to care for. And so we want to see this as a commons, and we say that uh, it must be managed. We're not talking about an unmanaged commons where anybody can do what they want. We're talking about a fiercely managed commons for the greater public good and to ensure that this, com this water commons is here for future generations because you know what? They have as much right to it as we do and we need to have that in our heads. Public trust is the law. It is the way in which you, uh, through your legal systems, through your policies, you enact the concept of the commons. Public trust would protect water systems, in this case our Great Lakes, as a shared resource that is carefully governed for the good of the whole community. Uh, public trust has very deep roots in the United States. Uh, it was used to curtail the diversion of water from, uh, to Los Angeles from a lake called Lake Mono, which was a very fragile lake. This was a very famous case because it established that even the tributaries into the lake um, were considered a public trust. The public trust notion goes back to Justinian times in Rome. It, it was part of the forming of the Magna Carta. They talk about the first enclosure of the commons in Great Britain when uh, the nobility owned the land, but it was understood the peasants had the right to make a living from it, grazing and fishing and hunting and so on. But they brought in laws to say, no, you can't do that anymore. And, and many, many, many people died because they no longer had access to these commons. So that was called an enclosure of the commons. And many of us think about water privatization today as kind of the second enclosure of, of the commons or different forms of, of, of privatization. Um, and this notion of public trust was used by Jim Olson and people in uh, Michigan where they fought uh, Nestle, the big bottled water company, the same Nestle that has Peter Brabeck, who's, you know, he and I are <laughs> oil and water. Uh, we have very different visions for the world's water. Um, and so this Nestle was in there uh, pumping huge amounts of water and they took it to court. They actually won, but then the company appealed and it, this goes on forever, but they did manage to have it understood that this water was a public trust. <clears throat> Vermont has a lot of groundwater. Vermont was allowing, uh, well, not allowing, weren't stopping big companies coming in and putting bore wells in and just helping themselves to the water, a lot of bottled water companies. 
And four or five years ago, they um, decided to protect their groundwater as a public trust. And they actually said that in times of shortage, that they actually go so far as to say there are, there are rules around who will get access. Water for drinking and daily living, water for the ecosystem, and water for local f uh, food, food uh, or you know, sustainable food development rather than for uh, massive export. Um, really a wonderful model, and they, <clears throat> the people of Vermont have already used their public trust law against a nuclear power plant that was leaking tritium into the local water source. And the, power, the, the nuclear company said, well, we, that's our water. And the, uh, <clears throat> the argument in court was, no, there's a law now that says that that water belongs to the people of Vermont, <clears throat> and you don't have the right to do that. Um, number two, <clears throat> this is just my little water here. Thank you, Lake. Uh, the number second principle I would promote is the concept that water also has rights. And this is a little harder to get our heads around. This isn't just saying that we all have right to water, but water has some rights to be protected from us. And this is a new concept a lot of us are working on. Certainly we know about conservation. We know that water has to be protected and conserved. Coming back to our Great Lakes watershed, we have to restore the wetlands, we have to do everything in our power. And we have to see the, the Great Lakes as one watershed and govern it as such. We need to ban fracking, we need to ban deep ocean uh, ballast dumping, we need to, uh, to ban bunker oil dumping, we need to ban these tar sands pipelines. I would like to be in a movement with you, Canada, and, and the people of Minnesota and Wisconsin to stop this uh, Alberta clipper because it's, it's, it's as dangerous as, as the Keystone pipeline. We should be banning bottled water. We don't need to take that beautiful water, put it in plastic and ship it around the world. Um, and I would argue um, we need to ban the, the, the shipments of nuclear waste from the Canadian side, which is beginning to happen. There's a lot of talk about putting it on barges and shipping it to some uh, parts of Michigan that apparently are prepared to take it. And I think we should say, no, you cannot use our Great Lakes for that. And as I said earlier, we have to stop seeing these water resources as something for our personal pleasure and, and profit and convenience and see it as the, the giver of life. And we have to learn some humility and learn to take our place in nature. We need to see what I call, uh, we need a new water ethic. And the, the water ethic needs to say that we need to put water at the heart of everything we do. Every law, every economic policy, every food policy, urban planning, instead of paving over rivers and streams, we have to let them flow and build around them and celebrate them and love them. And we have to, we have to take care of water and we need to do it really quickly because the statistics I gave you uh, a little while ago are real and they're terrifying and the water crisis is already here. So it's not as if we have a lot of time um, to do this. We're also working on the notion of something called the rights of nature. A man named Cormac Cullinan is a, a wonderful human rights and environmental lawyer from South Africa. He says, the day will come when the failure of our laws to recognize the right of a river to flow, to prohibit acts that destabilize the Earth's climate, or to impose a duty to respect the intrinsic value and right to exist of all life will be as reprehensible as allowing people to be bought and sold. He, he, he actually makes a connection between the way we treat nature and slavery. And that may seem extreme to you. And what he's not saying, you can't go fishing. But he is saying you can't fish a species to extinction. He's not saying you can't use the river for a commercial purpose. But he is saying if you kill the river, if you stop the river from flowing, then you've done harm. That we need, And we need to make our laws, our human laws, compatible to the laws of nature. And finally, I would argue that we have to really implement and move forward on the, the notion of the human right to water. This is where I started off on the issue of poverty, and I'll end with this. It was a huge fight to get the United Nations to recognize the human right to water and sanitation. You might think it's a motherhood. I think it's a motherhood. It was a huge fight. Water was not included in the original 1948 Declaration on the right, uh, on human right, of Human Rights because it wasn't seen as an issue at the time. It's only in the last couple of decades that we've realized that it's a huge human rights issue. And we've been working for two decades to try to get it recognized. Who's been against it? The World Bank. 
big parts of the UN, uh, an institution called the World Water Council, which is basically the big water companies. Uh, the big water companies, the bottled water companies, the big service companies like Suez, Veolia. My government was against it. Your government was against it. Great Britain was against it. Lots of big wealthy governments were against it because they don't want to expand the notion of human rights. And by the way, the, let me just say this. Human right to water does not mean you have the right to free water for your swimming pool and your golf course. There's no human right to water for a swimming pool, okay, just to be clear. The right, the human right to water is the right to water for life, for your daily needs, to cook and for health care in your home and so on. It's very, very clearly spelled out. Um, so we started uh, working towards this, building a global water justice movement. We call ourselves water warriors. And we were fighting privatization and fighting, f fighting uh, against uh, water cutoffs around the world where people were being denied water. And we took our fight to the UN, and in 2008, 2009, I had the honor of serving as a, an advisor to the 63rd president of the UN General Assembly, a wonderful uh, priest from Nicaragua, Father Miguel Descado Brockman, a wonderful man. And he brought me in, and he and Pablo Solo, who was the ambassador from Bolivia to uh, the UN, said, we're going to do this. And we got together and we put together a resolution to the UN General Assembly, that's all the countries of the UN, and basically it said simply that the UN rec General Assembly recognizes the human right to water and sanitation. Well, you would have thought we were asking for the sun, the moon, and the stars. One country after another said this stupidest thing, we're not ready, we need another 20 years of research. Uh, you, you just wouldn't believe the backlash. And then they tried to get um, Ambassador Solon, because he was the one who put it forward, it has to be a country, um, to, to, to drop sanitation. And he said, it's this lack of sanitation that's killing people. That's a worse killer than the lack of access to, to you know, the, the lack of drinking water is the fact that it's dirty. So he wouldn't do that. They tried one way and another to get him to weaken it, wouldn't do it. He said, you know what, I'd rather lose a good resolution than win one that doesn't have any teeth. And I'd like to see which countries in the world are going to vote against the human right to water. So on July 28, 2010, it went before the General Assembly to a vote. And if you've ever been to the UN you'll, and been in that big room, you'll know if it goes to a vote, they sit in their, their, at their seats at their tables, and it all goes on a big electronic board at the back, or at the front, so you see it right away. So I was in the balcony with my husband who was pacing, pacing, pacing. I said, if you don't stop pacing, you have to go out in the hall because I'm a nervous wreck, as it is. All right, I'll pace in the hall, he says. Out he goes. So, and I've got a couple of my staff, and we're holding hands, and I said, now we're not going to win, okay? We're not going to win today um, because I'm thinking, well, I've, you know, I've got to give them the wisdom of my whatever, blah, 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 and they're younger, and they're going to be disappointed, but we're going to lose. And uh, I said, we're not going to win, but we'll be back in two years, five years, whatever. We will come back, and we will win one day. Well, Pablo Solon gets up, and he gives a speech that it was so powerful, so from the heart, from his country and the kids who are dying in his country, that people were in tears. And then they called the vote, and one after another, they voted yes. 122 countries voted in favor. It was wonderful. Not one country voted against, including the countries that were opposed, like yours and mine. Uh, and 41 countries abstained. That was yours and mine, abstained. Uh, and we won. Uh, it was an historic day. And in my, in my opinion, we took as a human species an evolutionary step forward that day. It was a very moving, very moving thing to be part of. Uh, and you should know, because this is a very good thing to, for you to know, that the Human Rights Council adopted a similar resolution two months later describing in detail what this human right to water means and what obligations it places on governments. And the United States by that time had joined the Human Rights Council and voted for it. So your country did in fact take a very positive forward step. And then at the Rio meeting in June last year in, in Brazil, all the countries finally agreed that they, can't, they have to stop fighting it because it's <laughs> fait accompli. What it means basically is that many countries have since adopted the human right to water in their constitutions and one after another, uh, groups that didn't realize the importance of this are beginning to use it. And I want to end with one story and, 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 and one quick, um, and, and one, one, one story, one quote. 
The story I want to end with is a story of extreme poverty and injustice that has a lovely ending. So don't, I'm not going to depress you. It's a lovely ending. Botswana is an arid country, semi-arid country in South uh, Africa. And they have a big desert there called the Kalahari Desert. In the Kalahari Desert, they have bushmen. And they live the way their ancestors did. They have loincloths and spears, and they're hunter-gatherers. And they want to stay there. And the government of the day, the government who led this fight, a guy named Mogai, was educated at Oxford. He wore $3,000 Brioni suits. And he was privatizing everything in his country. And he wanted it to be a big modern country. And he called the Kalahari Bushmen an embarrassing anachronism. He wanted them out of the desert. And oh, by the way, they found diamonds in the desert. And that's what they really wanted, right? So first of all, they started forcibly moving them out onto settlements. And people were killing themselves. The kids were drinking, taking drugs. It was awful. Some of the people started coming back to the desert. They said, this is where we belong. It's where our souls are. It's where all our spiritual, cultural selves are. They came back to the desert. The government came in and they smashed their bore well. They had one water well, one open water well. And they smashed it and they said, if you try to reopen it, we'll put you in jail. And anybody caught bringing water to the Kalahari Bushmen will go to jail. I mean, it was really an abuse of human rights. Uh, and uh, the people stayed and persevered. And there's a, an incredible story in a book about uh, a woman elder, one of the tribal elders, who um, did without water for so long. She, any little water she would gain from melons or from the dew, because that's where they gathered water, she would give to her grandchildren. And she died um, of dehydration. And when they did an autopsy, her heart came out. Her heart was came to dust. Her heart came apart in the surgeon's hands. She had allowed herself to die so that the water could go to the young. It's a very <clears throat> moving story. So the Kalahari Bushmen went to court uh, with a group called Survival International supporting them. And they got the right to go back to the desert. And then they went back to court and they asked for the right to water. And they were denied it. That was two weeks before the UN passed, adopted this resolution on the human right to water. Based on that new resolution, they went to the next level of court. They went to the Supreme Court. And last January, they won unanimously not only the right to go back to the Kalahari Desert, but the right to water, the right to have their bore well reopened, and the right for financial compensation. And one of my favorite pictures anywhere is a group of people that I know from that, the Kalahari Bushmen, because we won an award together. Um, is them standing there as the, as the well is opened and they're taking their first water, um, the sweetest water on earth, I bet it tasted like for them. And you know, they could have moved off and had bottled water. I mean, they could have, but they chose to wait until they could have the water that came from their ancestors, the water that was their um, spiritual water. Um, and that's what that lake out there is lost my bearings wherever it is here. That's what this beautiful lake is. It's more water than the Kalahari Bushmen have, but it's our water, and it is ours to protect as stewards. So I'm going to end the, this with a, and I know I think we have a few minutes for, for a discussion, with a quote from, uh, this is from Gandalf, uh, from Lord of the Rings, from Tolkien. It's Gandalf, I loved it before the movies, although I loved the movies, but it's Gandalf looking at that terrible night when Evil, the army of evil is going to destroy everything. And you know, it's very much about the death of nature, a fight over nature. And I kind of have uh, Tolkien on the brain because I took a bunch of people on a tour of the tar sands of northern Alberta. And then we held a press conference in Edmonton, and I called it Canada's Mordor. And uh, one of the big uh, energy executives said to the media, should have said, that's a stupid statement. There's nothing, it's no, co no, no connection. What he said was, it's not as bad as Mordor, which I thought, oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no. It was like, how bad is half a death of nature or whatever? Anyway, this is Gandalf. And Gandalf is talking about being a steward. And I guess I want to say to you, and particularly to the youth and the students in this room, there is nothing you can do in your life better than being an activist or a steward, however you want to call it. Whether it's water or air or education or healthcare, whatever you choose, fighting for something that's bigger than yourself will give you a cause to live. And it is, I guarantee you, you'll have a better life than you if you just live. You know, and I'm nothing wrong with making money and all of that and raising a family and providing, but if that's all it's about, then you miss something really special. So here's Gandalf talking about being a steward. He says, the rule of no realm is mine. 
But all worthy things that are in peril, as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail in my task if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair or bear fruit and flower again in the days to come. For I too am a steward. Did you not know? Thank you so much. Please. Thank you so much for your talk and more to the point for your life's work. I teach the history and politics of religion and culture here at the college, so I was struck by your comment that we have lost the reverence for water, and I entirely agree. I wonder if you could talk a bit about your involvement with the uh, Idle No More First Nation movement in Canada. I understand that you, along with the great Canadian journalist Naomi Klein, returned a medal. Mm -hmm. from your Government of Canada. And uh, I, I think I read it on Naomi Klein's website, and I'm not exactly sure what the context was. Okay. So if you could maybe elaborate on those issues, I would be very happy. Thank you. I'd be delighted to tell that story. How about I take this uh, question, and then I'll, I'll come back and answer that so you don't have to stand the whole time. Uh, thank you. My question, uh, a, a simple one is, They've just announced a method of improving the efficiency of water desalinization by thousands of percents of improvement. Do you think that alone will be a significant improvement for the yeah. water deprived of the world? And then the second part of the question, I guess it isn't actually the same part of the question, do you see any way to reverse the trend toward privatization of waters? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, No, no, I see you. I, I see you. I wasn't forgetting. I was just wondering whether to take more, but I'll, I'll go back and answer these because sometimes if there's a long lineup, I take a bunch so people don't feel they have to stand too long. Uh, yes, thank you for that. What, okay, we live in, I live in Canada. Now, we still have a queen. I know, it's really embarrassing. We have a queen. <laughs> and we have a governor general. We have the queen is on our dollars. I mean, it's really embarrassing. And when I was a little girl, we always looked, used to look on the, on the dollar bill and we said the devil was in her hair. Like we always, we all, it was like a, a, an urban myth that, that, sh, that, that there was, it was hidden in there. Was, uh, don't, don't, this is irrelevant to the discussion, but, <laughs> but I'm just trying to explain why a modern country like Canada would have a queen who lives somewhere else and those strange children of hers and all of that and why we still have her as our queen. So trying to explain this to you is really difficult. So she is just a figurehead, and she had her diamond jubilee. That meant she was 50 years on the throne. Hallelujah. So our government started handing out medallion, Queen's Jubilee medallion medals to worthy people, and I got one in the mail. I got one. I was one of the, re the recipients. So I went around to my office. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the Queen's message on New Year's Day, but she talks like this. She says, my husband and I have had a very good year. Really, that's how she talks. So I was going around the office talking like that. Like I was, ir I was irreverent, okay? I wouldn't say this to a Canadian audience, but we were having a lot of fun that I got the Queen's Medal. Uh, Move ahead a couple of months, our government has dismantled all sorts of environmental laws to protect our water. The Fisheries Act, I'm not gonna name them because you won't know what they mean, but they're, because they're Canadian, but they're like the equivalent of the Clean Water Act here has been dismantled. This is a, we have the worst government ever anywhere in ever, ever in the history of the world. No, okay, that's not quite that bad, but I'm not fond of our government, it's very, complicated how we got them. We have this stupid first-past-the-post system, and so with only 36% of the vote, here they are. How many people know what his name is? Stephen Harper, bad man. So, let's just say, Stephen Harper, bad man. 
So Stephen Harper is, well, we're the only country in the world that ratified the Kyoto Accord and then backed out. I mean, how can you do that? It's just embarrassing. And last week, they took us out of the UN Convention uh, on uh, de Desertification, the only country in the world that, that every other country, including yours, is in. It's just embarrassing. So we're embarrassed. So uh, what happened, the Idle No More movement was a First Nations I think you, you use the term tribes or American Native here, we use the term, or they use the term First Nation in our country. It was people furious about the intrusion of these companies and these energy projects into their area with no longer these protections that the government just had removed them. So it was a protest against um, this. And there was a woman from a First Nations reserve that has no clean water up in the north who went on a hunger strike right in, right across the street from the parliament buildings and just sat there and defied the government. They wouldn't come over and talk to her. She became a national hero, like it was heroine. It was a big deal. Um, and I, so I returned the Queen's Jubilee Medal because I wanted to show uh, solidarity to the to the First Nations because I felt that they had been abused. They were saying that they had the treaty rights had been negotiated with the king at the time, with the with the in Crown of England, and not with the Canadian government. The Canadian government had no right to withdraw protection of, of, for them of their resources. I wanted to show solidarity, but it's really not easy to give a medal back. So we we got in a taxi, me and some of my gang at the office, and we I had a letter written to the governor general, who's the Queen's representative. He's just a He's nothing, he's just nothing. He just goes to ceremonies and pins things on people. He's got no power. Uh, but he's got this gorgeous residence, this beautiful, beautiful residence across from the Prime Minister's house. And so we went up to the gates and I said, I just want to drop a letter. When I got there, they figured out who I was and the security came and we were all surrounded by security. It was like, I just want to give a medal back, you know. It just So it was really in protest to stand with First Nations uh, on, in their, on their concern around what had happened. Um, very much like, I think you've got one, you've got the, the Bad River uh, re protest and then there's another one in Wisconsin, I believe, and it's the, the Red Thank you, and it's around the pipeline. So, I mean, it's the, that kind of solidarity, just to show solidarity with the, uh, you know, people who are, f that's why I keep making the connection between environmental destruction and, and poverty and injustice, because the whole notion of environmental justice is, as we know, is that where you're gonna dump your pollutants and where you're gonna do all your worst damages is in communities where the people are the least powerful. Either it's a poor neighborhood in an urban center, or it's a, an indigenous, community or it's a peasant community in the global south where there isn't the power base to fight back. And so, you know, finding ways to stand with them is really important. Um, on um, the desalinization, I've read about a number of projects to de for desalination and, and I'm certainly open. If they're able to find a, a, a desal a technique that that's going to have to be part of the solution. But let me tell you that currently desalinization is energy intensive, it's very expensive, and it puts a salt and poison chemical laden brine back into the into the water. And I, I just did some writing on this about the Gulf, uh, in um, the Arabian Gulf, and they're now talking about peak salt. So much salt has been put back into the Gulf. And because they've dammed the rivers, the rivers aren't washing it out to the ocean. I mean, it's all connected. So what's happening is that the, the they're actually saying that the, the point is gonna come when it's not gonna be worth it to suck that water in because isn't enough water to be taken out of the salinated water. The water is the water is the, the Gulf is dying um, uh, because it's so salted. So and and many studies like this around the world with desalination. So stay. I'm totally open to what technology might do, but at the moment, um, I'm I'm yet to be convinced on the question of reversing privatization. You bet we've fought privatization in all parts of the world, and we're winning in many many parts. Um, Suez and Veolia, the two biggest. Water companies have basically cut back dramatically. Um, Suez has announced it's out of Latin America. We're not welcome there. Well, that's true. Uh, a number of uh, municipalities in, in, in this country, Atlanta, Georgia, a number of uh, municipalities tried privatization and have worked uh, moved away from it. So it's really important, but there is a new piece of legislation that I just came across that is going to connect 
federal funding, which has already happened in my country, federal funding to municipal projects here on the basis that they go public-private partnership. So we need to watch that really closely. But what happens is when you've had, like you get a private company coming in and running your water services, what are they doing? They're putting some investment up front. And then they get to, once their investment's paid back, they get to pay, get these, these profits for years and years and years. You're basically handing off this project to your kids and your grandkids, literally. Uh, it's just, it, it's a, it's a, Paris, the city, they've remunicipalized 43 cities in Paris. They were all private. They've all gone back to public management, including Paris, which was never under public management. It's always been uh, run by these same two companies. And they, when the contract ended two years ago, they brought back public, uh, or brought Paris under public uh, uh, ownership, or control, government control, and they've um, been able to reduce the rates and the water quality has gone dramatically up because there's no profit motive. There's no need to find some of the money from the, the, the rates people pay to pay exorbitant salaries or uh, to pay shareholders. All of it goes back into service or protecting source water. So, I mean, I would, I'm not against the, you know, the private sector and as a concept, but I think we have to carve out certain areas that we say this is a commons, this, this is a public trust, this isn't for that. And I would argue water just tops those. Um, yes. Thank you for all your work. I, a lot of big fans of yours in the crowd here. Um, I'm working on, uh, with a lot of people on this large mine issue that the Bad River Reservation is being confronted with and, and the, the acid mine drainage, sulfuric acid mine drainage that would happen by the overburden being placed in the watershed um, is a confrontation to the public trust doctrine of Wisconsin. This is a nice idea. I talked to my state senator yesterday about, well, how can we get going on this? And he says, well, the damage has to show up. And I, I think, how, how do we get to the precautionary principle? How do we get from the situation where we wait till the corpse arrives to be able to yeah. take it into court? I'm not sure that's true, okay? And, and I'm not an American and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not, I will have to defer to others who would know this better, but I don't think that's true. And I would suggest you get a hold of Jim Olson in Michigan, who is one of the top uh, legal minds, legal scholars on the public trust in, in, uh, in, in, in the United States. Now, it does differ from state to state, I understand that, but I do not think you have to show damage. Uh, I think you can show potential damage, and I, I, I would argue that, that I wouldn't take that at face value. Um, how do we move the, the bar on this so that it's no longer, um, you know, always reacting, that's, that's the essence of the question that you're asking. And what we're proposing with this notion of the rights of nature is that we're much more proactive. And in fact, after the COP15, the, the, um, the climate summit in Copenhagen three years ago, um, I, co co okay, you go get off the plane in Copenhagen and you're greeted by little people dressed, I don't mean children, I mean young people dressed in Coca-Cola elf outfits, greeting you with cups of Coca-Cola. I'm not making that up. And videos and advertising for Coca-Cola and pictures of happy children running through clean meadows and lovely clean water. And they called it Hopenhagen. So of course I started calling it Copenhagen because everyone... <laughs> And when I got on a plane to leave, because people had been brutally treated, there were really, really, really bad, the bad human rights abuses. Like the government of this wonderful country, this, 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 you know, modern European country, actually turned around and suspended civil rights for the entire week before, the the week of, and the week after. And they were able to pick people off the street and deport them if, if they didn't like the cut of their jib. They were just able to send them back. Um, so, I was, so I saw a lot of brutality, particularly towards young people. So when I got on the plane to get home, I went to the airport, and some chipper little Coca-Cola elf spoke to me. I, I'm, I'm, afraid I, I'm afraid I used a, an F word that I shouldn't have used. <laughs> to a Coca-Cola elf, I feel really, I still feel badly. I'd like to find the little elf and apologize to her, but it was like, give me a break. It was such a failure, Copenhagen, Copenhagen was such a failure that President Evo Morales of Bolivia called the climate justice movement to Cochabamba a couple of months later. This was April 2010. He expected a couple thousand people, 32,000 of us descended on him, right? 
And out of that came a bunch of things, but one of the most exciting for me was a declaration on the rights on the right of the rights of nature, which we are hoping one day will stand side by side with the UN Declaration on Human Rights as a kind of companion manifesto of our time. And this notion basically is that as it currently stands in most countries, nature is property. And the only way you can get restitution if something has happened is if you can show your property was damaged. But that's not speaking for, the, for, the, for, the, for nature. Um, a friend of mine says, what would happen if, if, the, if the Gulf of Mexico could sue BP? <laughs> you know, I mean, think of it. You know, how can we get our minds around a different way of looking at nature, which I think is what you're getting at, which is coming at it in front. And that's what we're talking about with this Great Lakes. If any of you are interested in more on this, go to my, our website is called canadians.org, very easy. Everybody's mad because we got that early on because it's terrific. And I, I've got a number of papers you might be interested in. One is Our Great Lakes Commons, it's called. Another is called, um, is, if you're interested in the, um, the human right, the, the declaration, of, uh, the resolution on human rights, I've got a, a, a paper on that, what it means. And, and there's one on Food and Water Watch's website on, on, on what it means in the US and where the problems are here and what people can do here. So there's been a lot of work done on, on this since. But, we really need to get a, uh, in front of it. And the, the idea around this Great Lakes concept of the commons and the public trust and seeing it as a protected bioregion is that we would be a step ahead and we wouldn't have to wait till the damage is done, which is, I think, the essence of your, of your question. I'll do this and then here, and then I, I bet I, I knew it. You and I are on the same page. Um, so I teach biology as a TA at UMD, but I did my undergrad at Concordia and Moorhead and I majored in environmental studies, so I learned a bunch of stuff, but I came in as a freshman not knowing any of it, and now I teach a bunch of freshmen who don't know anything about the environment. Um, and I'm always trying to get them, like, here, know this little thing and this little thing. How do you, how, what is your best suggestion for getting high school kids and college fresh, freshmen, or those who aren't going on to college, to know this sort of stuff? Because I can sort of reach them in the classroom, but only to yeah. a certain degree. No, it's the hardest question of all. And, and, and to an extent, you're asking us to address apathy or what I call the myth of abundance. You, you can come at it either way. I mean, if you're living beside this lake, it's pretty darn hard to think that there's a water crisis anywhere. And it's pretty easy to think there are many other issues. So, and of course, I didn't just talk about water tonight. I talked about poverty and injustice and, and nature generally. Um, one good thing that I have found, uh, one, the, the one campaign on high schools is about bottled water. People get it, and I have been involved in a number of universities, colleges, high schools where they've done really innovative things. There was one community college in Canada where they gathered the bottle, the water bottle, empty bottle, uh, water bottle, you know what I'm saying, water bottles, <laughs> water bottle. I've been talking all day, water bottles uh, from the uh, cafeteria and from the vending machines for I think it was just like two weeks or something, and then they put them end to end and they snaked right through the campus right outside, right down the street, right around, you know, the entire campus. They, and the newspapers came and took pictures. It was on the front page of the newspaper showing this. Uh, and this was very exciting. And, and we have a, a, this is a nice story. There's a, a little girl, a young girl now. Uh, she was 11 years old. Um, she lives in Kingston, Ontario. And she saw a film that was made about one of my books on water called Blue Gold, and it upset her so much. She came home and she said to her mother, I want to do something. And her mother said, well, let's call the mayor. So they called the mayor and said, can my daughter come and talk to you about protecting water? Kingston's on the St. Lawrence. So he said, sure, and invited the media, of course. He's no fool. He got a little 11-year-old wants to say, Mr. Mayor, save our water. And he would say, yes, I will, my dear. So he invited the media, and of course, she was really knowledgeable, because she came to us, and we just gave her all this great stuff, right? <laughs> Uh, so then she said, she, he said, well, what can I do for you? She said, I want to present to city council. Now, we've got a project in Canada where we get municipalities to vote themselves blue communities. It's a really positive concept. And a blue community can be described in different ways. One of them is that they won't provide bottled water. They're not saying you can't have it, but they're not going to provide it uh, on municipal property, that they agree that water is a human right and that they... Um, will not go private. They will not have private services. They'll keep water public. But you can, you, you could expand it to taking care of resource water, all sorts of things. So she decided she wanted Kingston to go as a blue community. She went before them. Great big 
debate happened and Nestle, the big water company, uh, came in and they said, you're listening to an 11-year-old girl, goodness gracious, and one of them said, pick on somebody your own age, and it was like, really? And I thought, yeah, pick on me, I'm, 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 I'm game. But uh, anyway, she won. And she was so excited that for two years, she's 13 now, she's gone around to something like 22 uh, municipalities in her area in, in southern Ontario, southwestern Ontario, and she has, uh, southeastern Ontario, and she has got something like 18 of them have declared <laughs> themselves to be blue communities. This is a child. This is a kid going, she's just going into high school now. And so, you know, I'm not saying every young person is going to be that, but I think when people see a piece of it, then the piece opens up and starts to become everything else. Water's a wonderful teacher. When you get some, some piece of it, you can often then get the next piece, and it, it leads you into a lot of understanding about injustice in, in general. But it's a hard one, getting people to care. You know, when the tur they turn the tap on and the water doesn't come out or it comes out brown, then they want to know what happened. But until then, for a lot of people, I'm afraid it's the reality. It's just, you know, it's it's uh, it's hard, and we need to teach it in schools. We need to teach citizenship, as in, it's okay to be angry, and it's okay to agitate, and it's okay, you know, to um, not in any violent way, but in a in a respectful way. It is okay to challenge that kind of authority. Last question. Thank you so much, Maud uh, Barlow, for coming and being here. It really means a lot to us. Um, I too am working on the um, the proposed Pinocchio mine, and um, um, it, it's a really big deal for the lake because 40% of the wetlands will be affected. The, the, the hills gather up the water, and um, all the, the rivers that come from the north and the south side all end up in Lake Superior. It's like a big step right down to the lake. So um, our, our Wisconsin laws have just been changed with the mining. We have been working on this, and it just has changed, and it is a heartbreak, let me tell you. So now what we have is um, the Bad River Tribe has a treaty rights, and they have been totally overlooked. So our next best option is to um, go through litigation through treaty rights. And the Bad River Tribe does have a casino, but it's small, and they are poor. And we're holding spaghetti dinners, and we need funding. So knowing that Lake Superior has 10% of the water, fresh water in the world, and knowing that this Pinocchio mine would be the biggest taconite mine in the world, and knowing that it goes straight to the lake. Is there any funding options? We need a lot of money, of course, with the litigation on, on this side. And if you knew me, I am a person who abhors money, but I'm asking, do you have any idea of large funding that goes for water? It would, it's a very hard question for me to answer. On my side of the border, I would be able to give you, because I'm Canadian, so it's very hard for me to say what might exist in Wisconsin. I'm sure there would be money, and I cannot imagine that there wouldn't be some funding from some of the major environmental groups, some of the foundations here. Um, and there, I expect if anybody in the audience would be able to help the folks that are working on this, this is clearly something that you could, the community could come around, something very specific, you could, specific to work on um, testing this notion of protecting the lakes, um, but I, I am sure that there would be funding. It would be a case of, of doing some research and some searching on it. Um, but this is a call, a plea for help, so anybody who wants to chat, what's your, what's your first name? Amy Wilson. So say, come see, see Amy, thank you. Quick, 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 because that quick, quick, quick. Living in a consumerist culture where cons rapid consumerism is not only normalized but is celebrated, I think, especially among the youth of today, what can we do not only as students but as youth to pr not only to protect our waters but to create a reverence for them? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you just did. <laughs> uh, I mean, just your standing up and saying that and, and recognizing the need for that is really important. And, uh, you know, we need your voices. You're, you're an incredibly, every generation is incredibly important, but you're incredibly important because 
we are at this kind of pivotal time and we need the voices of young people. And I actually have great faith. I know one of the earlier questions was about apathy, but I think when people really hear and really find out and, and it touches their heart, something changes. And I've, I've, I've just watched wonderful transformations. So uh, set yourself on a path to find a way to find other people who think like you do. Don't do it alone. It's really important to find a community of spirits, if you will, who who share your values. I know they exist here in this community. I've met them here today. Um, and uh, walk that journey. You, it's, it's, um, it'll be challenging uh, and many times, but it, it, it is just a very important thing for you to do and for, us to, and for us to live and articulate an alternative way of being is part of the story that you're telling, I think, and incredibly important. So I appreciate it. I'll take you out. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll, we'll grab it anyway. Thank you very much, and thank you, Maud. Um, we have a reception in the uh, in the lobby, and we have some books to sell. So we'll see you on the other side. Thank you all very much for coming.